This is one of their mobile kitchens that they actually is that even some uh, what I call habitual beautiful stop and shop in the Wilton penalty, but it was actually a tax, and that it. Good evening and welcome once again to the Marty Heiser Show. You know, sometimes in your life, you're thrown into a situation where you, are, you have a front row seat to some of the most incredible heroics that you can ever imagine. I mean, this is like uh, Congressional Medal of Honor stuff. I am honored, I am humbled to have three heroes joining us this evening who, and it's funny, because when you talk about heroes and stuff like that, none of these guys are seeking the limelight. You have no idea the, the arms I had to twist to have them come in here. But what happened was such a happy, wonderful ending, no loss of life story that unfolded this past Sunday that I just wanted to, I begged them to come in just to share their story and what happened. Local news has picked up on this. If we can get, if we can get this uh, on uh, our, our vast technical support team. But his, this is how it appeared on the local news. Um, bear with me, here we go, here we go. Okay, here we go. Well, there you got a little bit. We had a little trouble with the sound on that, but you got a little bit of the flavor of what happened. Let me just set the scene. Basically, Walnut Hill Community Church, which has its uh, home church here in Bethel, Connecticut, on Walnut Hill Avenue in Bethel, has some satellite churches. One of the satellite churches is located on Bunker Hill in Waterbury, Connecticut. Now, the Bunker Hill Congregational Church congregation was unbeliev unbelievably gracious in that as their congregation aged and the church fell more silent over, say, the last decade, they found it in their hearts to literally donate the church, the property, the building, and all the grounds to Walnut Hill Community Church, which is a younger church with younger families. And Walnut Hill was able to take over the property and is now using it. They just started taking it over maybe a month or two ago. And you have a younger congregation that's coming in. And this congregation wants nothing more than to be a, a loving community and reach out to the existing neighborhood that's there. That's the background. And then last Sunday morning, as the church was in their service, well, let's turn to our heroes. We have uh, uh, Tony Bacafuso. Did yep. I kill Bacafuso, that name? Bacafuso, right. I got it. And we have Tim McCandless, mm -hmm. who's a newly elected elder, I believe. You know, and some people are demanding a recount, but I think, I think, I think you're in. And then Harold Ath Althan. I, I got it right. What happened? You were there in the congregation. What happened last Sunday? Well, um, I'm part of the worship team. We were, we were playing. We got, we got finished playing. Um, we ended up sitting down. We were listening to pastor. And uh, someone looked over to the right and said fire. And we were able to see flames through the stained glass. Uh -huh. And as soon as fire was yelled at, me and a few gentlemen ended up darting out, out, of the, out of the building and ended up seeing the house that was engulfed in flames. As soon as I look to the right and seen the house, I look up and I see a family up on the, on the roof and I'm like, oh my God, what are we gonna do? <laughs> yeah, okay. 
So, first keep thing, going, keep I, going. I don't look, mind the, don't the mind father the wanted to toss his child to me. I'm like, yes. wait a minute, please. Uh -huh. I look to the left and I see a blanket on, hanging up. Yes, yes, go ahead. So, we go over there, we go to grab the blanket, and another gentleman, Will, sees um, a stove on the porch. Right. Pushes all the stuff off the porch, jumps up on the porch on top of the stove. The father starts handing his children down to us, and we start, you know, handing handing them down the chain, and uh, and we ended up saving their lives. Thank how many, God. How many people were up on that on that porch roof? I want to say there was uh, five. about five people all together. Yeah. yeah, three children and uh, two adults. Now, when people talk about this. Um, one of the, uh, uh, Luke, how do you, Amory? Amory. 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 Yep. Yeah. His mother talked about how this is, and you get to see this if you can see some of the fire here on, on uh, some of the videos that were caught. This is a, a, in a large house, as you can tell oh, yeah. from the pictures, totally engulfed in flames. I mean, the heat, people said when they opened up the church door, the heat was so oppressive that the heat just swept into the church, and the church is, you know, a good 100 feet away from it. What, well, Tim, I'll ask you, what, what did, was going through your mind when you went towards this inferno rather than, you know, the natural self-preservation uh, uh, moving away from it? Well, it's really hard to, to, to think. I mean, well, actually, when I, when I heard someone yell fire like Tony, I looked and you could see this ball of fire through the stained glass window. And I stood up and took a step towards the aisle. I was sitting on that side of the church and you could feel the heat coming through the wall, through yeah. the window. Um, and I followed, you know, Tony and, and Will Chapman were ahead and I was following them to the back door. And, and like you said, you open the door and you could see the flames at that point coming mainly just out of the front windows of the house. Yeah. And, uh, you know, because I saw Will and Tony vaulting over the railing of the, of the ramp on the back of the church. I started to follow, follow along. And then that's when I saw the family up on, on the porch roof. And you know the fire at that point was still more towards the front of the house, so we you know we ran to the back. I wasn't really thinking much other than you know we got to get them down out of there. You yeah, know? and now, I just kind of followed followed Will's lead at that point. Will Chapman, uh, just a fascinating guy. He's a mm -hmm. is he currently a Newtown uh, policeman? Yes. He, okay, yep. and he was also the first responder. There's another picture of the fire. This is how mm -hmm. basically what you were what you were faced when you're right. making these life changing, life-saving decisions. Um, Will Chapman was one of the first uh, responders at, at Sandy Hook. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, I've heard uh, he's basically when he was there, there was still gunfire being happening and his first responder, you can only imagine. Was his, what was his sort of temperament? Uh, um, uh, Harold, let me ask you, when, when you were out there, was he kind of? When I saw him, he was, it was like he was in professional mode. I mean, he didn't say anything to anyone. He literally acted. Mm -hmm. He just jumped up on top of that stove and took those kids and just started handing them down to us. And we just, uh -huh. one after another, just started, I mean, he was, after he got everybody off, he ran back into the church and said, I got to get the people out of the church. Yeah. After <laughs> I took the yeah. kids around okay. the back of the building, yeah. he met us in the, in the, in the side on Bunker Hill Road, sat the kids down and wanted to know if they were all breathing okay. Sat every single one of them down, smiled, wow. asked their names, and once everybody could breathe, then I kind of didn't see him for a while after that. I mean, I, he, he was interesting because he has like a, a badge on a, on a chain, mm -hmm. and he you know took the took the badge out and put it on there. There was a, a one. There was been many articles in different papers. There was one picture that I thought was was really chilling. Um, as I put this picture up, hopefully I'll be able to find it here. This will just take a second to mm -hmm. talk amongst yourselves. Um, but uh, it was basically a picture of, um, uh, of the back porch and that, and stove, that stove that you yeah. talk about. Yeah. Let me see if I can get it to come up. I'm having trouble. But uh, the, in, in, that, in the one stove that was there, because there was a back porch. I'll get it here in just a second. Okay, here we go. Um, there was a stove on the back, and you think, wow, what's a stove doing on the back? But if you can get a picture of that, um, what did that stove mean is a difference between how to get up on that roof well, or not? Like Tony said, when we first got out there, the, the, the father, the man on the roof, he wanted to toss the kids down. I mean, the fire was coming through the house. Uh -huh. I've never seen fire move that quickly. And 
that was the last thing we wanted to have to do was try to catch these kids because it was several steps up to the porch and then it was the full height you know of a, the story of the and first there was floor. sort of an incline in the yard in, in, in the, the yard was a little here slope. this is what we're seeing now yeah so, so this, this stove yeah. and by the way where you see the sky there that's where the porch roof used to be right. yes. that's where all those people were stranded out right. there and uh, and then how did that stove come into play? Well, at first, you know, Luke, I think Tony and Luke saw that there was a blanket hanging on the clothesline. So they thought, well, we'll stretch that out and then maybe they can, you know, drop the kids down and we'll catch them. I, saw it, on, I saw it in a movie once. Yeah, yeah okay. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Will, he hopped up on the porch and, and you know, that he just shoved that stove up against the wall and jumped up on top of it. And he's so tall, he could reach right up to the roof line at that point. So the father or the, the uncle was yeah. there with small babies, right. small children. And he, yeah. So we just you know, got in a line and started passing the kids down and getting them off wow. the roof. Wow. I mean, it's, it's just really, it's, it's so, when I was rereading re uh, uh, some of these articles, you, you can't help but getting choked up a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, there was a family, the picket. Taro family that was there. Uh, Crystal was uh, one, I think, that was on the roof. Leah McDougal, I believe, was one of the one uh, the guys that grabbed the kids, and the fire was coming up the stairwell so fast. All he could think to do is jump out the jump out of the window. Yeah, Crystal, it's Marty Heiser. You're live on well, not exactly nationwide TV, but we are on TV. Uh, we're here with Tim, Tony, and Harold, who were some of the guys that that helped out last Sunday. I wonder if you could just recall and, and share what, you're, what you remember from Sunday and, and how it all happened. Oh, of course. Um, um, that morning, I wanna say it was like 9.30, I got up and uh, my two daughters were laying down and uh, she was watching TV. I go downstairs, I look into my dad's room all the kids are, you know, chilling and watching TV with him. So I'm like, you know, I'm going to go get coffee. I'll be back. He's like, all right. I go, I'm in my car for like three minutes because I can't find my debit card. And I'm like, where did I put it? And then I finally found it. <laughs> so then I go down to Dunkin' Donuts and Thomas and I have, not Thomas, and I have a, what is that, um, water counter or something? Right. Like right, right down the street. And then, uh, the drive through my uh, a family friend called, her name is Jada, and uh, she was like, what are you doing? And I'm like, getting coffee, you know? <laughs> and she's like, well, it's so nice out, why don't we, you know, go to the beach? And I'm like, you know what, let's do that, you know? <laughs> so then I go to her house, which is literally 30 seconds away from Dunkin' Donuts. And I get to the top of the stairs and into a bedroom, and I'm getting a phone call from Shane, but I didn't even know who it was because, like, I didn't know the number, so I had Jada answer the phone. And uh, Jada was like, who's this? And um, Shane's screaming, the house is on fire, the house is on fire. And she's like, who is this? And I, I take the phone, and I'm like, who is this? And Shane's like, the house is on fire. And I'm like, that's not even funny. And he was like, no, I'm not <laughs> kidding. Like, you need to get home right now. So, Crystal, and, did you know uh, Liam McDougal? Yeah. So that's you, my daughter. That's your daughter? Yeah. Okay, so what, what, now tell a little bit what, what their story was as far as how they had to get out onto the, uh, the back porch roof and what transpired from there. <laughs> Well, when I, when I was told from my youngest, uh, well, my oldest, I mean, uh, Gabriella, she said her and Leah ran out the back door. And I guess Leah ran to the church, and Gabby started running down the street, and then I guess she realized she had a remote in her hand, so she started running back to the house. Because she wanted to return the remote? Yeah, she went to the house, and eventually one of our neighbors um, saw her, and he scooped her up, and he brought her across to our other neighbor, who was like a great across the street from her. Right. Um, and they got her into safety, and they're actually the ones who called the uh, fire department to let them know my house was on fire. Wow. And, yeah, because like when I got there, 
I'm like, you know, I'm hauling butt all the way there. I can't even get to my house, so I park next to the pharmacy. I'm running so hard, I, I lost my And then, the And house. then for a minute, for a minute, no one knew where Gabby was or no, Gabriella, no right? Yeah, nobody, because at, at first they were like, oh, she's with my dad. So she didn't call him my dad. She finally gets a hold of him, and he's like, no, I don't have Gabby. I've been looking for Gabby. Wow. And I'm like, oh, my God, great. So me and Gina's mother, Mary, are running up and down the street all yeah. over the place screaming for Gabby. An officer finally tracks her down. She's at the neighbor's house across the street. Wow. Well, listen, uh, your dad, Tom, right? Yes. So now he was in the house. What was his story as far as how, how everything happened? He said that he would, he would see every weekend, uh, my dad used to get out to breakfast on Saturdays and Sundays. He, uh -huh. You know, they have a routine. And so I guess he was, like, getting up out of bed, and he noticed it was dark, but, like, it was like not raining or nothing, you know. So he went to go outside, and he went when he went to go outside. He touched the door and noticed, boom, our house is on fire. So he's <laughs> screaming for everybody to get out of uh, the house, and he's throwing the animals out the window. He in that meantime, Gabby and Leah already left the house. Wow. Yeah, and then um, he's outside. And I guess our dog, Madison, jumped right back in the house. Duck jumped back in the house, and the other dog. And so yeah, the one, the, the really dumb, fat, pudgy dog decides the thing to do is to run back into the kitchen. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I don't know. I guess she, <laughs> she thought she had to stay in the house. Well, Crystal, listen, we have uh, Tim, Tony, and Harold. They were here. Uh, do you want to say anything to them before we cut off here? I just want to say thank you, guys. I honestly, I don't. That day could have turned out so much different had you guys been there. We, today, I could be sitting here with a life loss instead of just out. Well, Crystal, listen, you know what? It's kind of funny. Your dad's on the other phone, so I'm going to pick him up. Okay. Okay, thanks. Tom, uh, we were just talking to your daughter, Crystal, about what happened uh, during the fire. Okay. So are you here at the studio? I'm at, I'm at Suds and Duds. Oh, okay, <laughs> so you'll want to go right <laughs> from Suds and Duds, look to your right, and head towards the uh, railroad tracks. Okay. Go to your right and head towards the railroad tracks. But but while you do, what was your recollection of uh, that time when the fire? We, we have Tim, Tony, and Harold here. They were in the back, uh, by the back porch there. Well, um, I know that I was trying to get the dogs out. They kept going back in. Um, I tossed, finally tossed them out, slammed the door, and they took off for the uh, for the church, I think. Yeah. And one of them, one of the dogs went under the car, and the other one just started barking at everybody. And uh, I mean, I not to sound, you know, too whatever, but um, the uh, okay. Have you found the studio there? Uh, not yet. I took a right. I'm on. I'm going by Food Mart or something like that. Okay. All right. I have. I do not see it yet. Okay. So, uh, here maybe I can chug, give you the phone and you could help them with the. Okay. Hold hold the line and we'll uh, we'll get you in here. And when, and when you come in, we'll put you right into the studio. But uh, basically, you want to go down to uh, uh, come by the railroad tracks. That'll be good. Okay, so I'll give you. A, um, anyways, those were some of the Tony's. Uh, Tom is on his way, and he's literally right around the corner. Of the suds and does yeah. there. Yeah. Let's just talk from a from a Christian God spiritual perspective. What's your takeaway? You guys are all men of faith. Mm -hmm. What What's your thought? My thought is that it was just a. It, we were put there for. For a reason, that church is, was there, and, and we were put there for a reason. And, a, and to me, that the reason is personally, you know, God's 
been in my life for a while and as soon as that happened you know all of us came as one and, and ran to the people there's a Our verse church. in the bible that says uh, greater love have no man than he lay down his life for a friend mm -hmm. and when i think of what you guys did that day with with just complete disregard for your own safety seeing what needed to be done and doing it um i i don't know it's it's a great expression i think of your christian faith tim your you know thoughts? i mean marty I, while it was going on i really didn't fear at all i mean i didn't feel any fear it uh -huh. was just you know i've got i've got four kids i've got two grandkids about the ages of those kids that were on the roof you just see that and you you just have to react yeah and it really wasn't until we'd got them down and we took them around the back side of the church you know we couldn't see the house anymore and and you know will was checking them out and then other people were there you know making sure they were good i went and walked back around to the front side of the church where you could see the house and in, in some of those pictures you showed where it was just entirely engulfed at that point yeah and, and we had been been at that back porch you know maybe four minutes before that yeah. and it was, that's when it kind of hit you how, how how you know God had his hand on us so I can tell you yeah. that you know well even even Luke said and it was interesting because you really didn't think of this but had that fire happened an hour before or mm -hmm. two hours later we wouldn't have been and there yeah. wasn't a congregation of obviously fit young men <laughs> like yourselves ready to spring into action right. It could have it could have been such a such a horrific uh, um, you know result. Because um, there's there's literally a fire station a block away, and you yeah. can see by the the video. I think you can even hear that the sirens are rolling up, and it's totally engulfed. So I yeah. mean, as fast as they got there, it, that's how the fire was was that quick yeah. to take that house. Harold, what's what's your takeaway from this? When I uh, saw Tony run out the door, and when then I opened the door and saw those flames. Uh, Seriously, the very first thing I, I saw was I, I looked at pure evil. Wow. I, I saw a life taker, and yet God's hand came in and became a lifesaver. Wow. wow. There's a verse, it's, it's, a, it's a fun little verse in Ecclesiastes. It says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either one of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. You know, and I think, you know, when you do, when you're a Christian, it's kind of like a team sport. You know, you do life together. You do life in community. And you're there to pick each other up. And I think individually and as a, as a community, that's what we're trying to do. But we also want to be a, a light in the world. We want to be a salt and light. And if, if the, when the guy comes, just let me know. If someone will let me know if he's here. That would be great. Um, but uh, I think we want, we want to have that positive influence in the community. And when you have an opportunity like that to, to physically express your love for kind of like strangers, but your love for the community and to do that in such a tangible way, to me it's just a beautiful expression of, of what it means to be a Christian. Uh, that's kind of, you know, my, my, my takeaway from it anyways. Yeah. But, um, all right, where does uh, Waterbury, Walnut Hill, uh, Waterbury go from here? Well, I think we, we keep on being a church. And, you know, we had been meeting in a school on the other side of town. And then, you know, for years we've been looking for the right place. Yeah. Uh, you know, we know this is the right place. And yeah. we're there to, to minister to that community. Right. And this is just, you know, you know, one way that God put us there at this, this time, this point, to, to help that family. And, yeah. and you know, we're going to be there. We're there for the long haul for the, for the, the city and, and that, that neighborhood. It was interesting after sort of, you know, the shock troop like you guys <laughs> did all the death-defying stuff, mm -hmm. that, that family was just engrafted mm -hmm. into the church. Sure. The kids were taken care of. Uh, people were giving them literally the shoes off their feet, you know, to do anything, anything that we, they could possibly do. Um, and I don't know, I'd obviously I'd like to see that continue. Mm -hmm. um, we had uh, uh, Tom uh, Pig, Pignataro, and he was literally outside, so we're hoping that if, he, if he's here or if they've been able to track him down and have him come in, I, I'd just love to get his perspective, mm -hmm. uh, you know, on, on all that. Um, if I could give my phone back too, you know what I'd like to do is get uh, Will Chapman on the phone too. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I just think that his his reactions, because I mean, truth be told, I was in the church as well. We were ushering people out 
by the time we got everyone out of the church, you know, because there's a lot of kids, there were a lot of kids and everything like that, you know, we turned to look and go back, and that's when I saw Will, you know, in complete superhero mode. Oh, yeah. um, and he just seemed, like you said, calm, matter of fact, you know, taking care of things that, that needed to be done, asking questions like, is everyone's air airways open? Are mm -hmm. people breathing? Is there any residual things? Um, I don't know. I was just very impressed by Will. What did mm -hmm. you think? Oh, Will was, Will was top notch. He didn't even think twice. He yeah. sprung right into action. He didn't, like, like uh, Harold said, he didn't even speak. He was just there doing what he does. Mm -hmm. Was a machine. Uh, okay, so uh, the other guys, not nah, nah, okay. So we'll, we're, we got to move on. But listen. God bless. Thank I'm you. Really, I'm proud to know you guys. Ex you, excellent Mike. job, and thank you so much. And you know, if Tom does show up, maybe we can have him circle back back, and we'll we'll go on. But we really appreciate you uh, taking the time to come. Okay, our next guest is Nadia Gerwell, and now Nadia has an incredible following of her own. She's a mom coach, which might sound a little I don't know counterintuitive or something like that. But, um, yeah, if everyone, um, she's going that way. Um, he's a, uh, she's a mom coach, and she basically is uh, just learning what it means to be a single mom, raising a family, and having a business, and juggling a lot of responsibilities. Uh, Nadia has a uh, Facebook posting and other uh, um, things that she's involved with, and she talks quite candidly about her uh, struggle with depression, her raising, I think, four children, including a, a, a set of triplets. Uh, she talks a little bit about um, what, uh, how parents can get their uh, strength and where they need to find their strength from. And also in um, somewhat of like divorce recovery and what it means to be both a mother, a parent, an independent business owner, and uh, kind of keeping all those balls in the air. So Nadia, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I really, I really appreciate it. Yeah, the, um, that's quite some story with that fire though, huh? Yes, definitely quite I mean, captivating. It was, it was, it was unbelievable. Yeah. And uh, when Tom comes, when Tom does show up, have him come in, because he'll give the perspective from inside that, that inferno. But um, what prompted you to do these blog postings and, and uh, your interest in being a mom coach? What, what brought that about? Because I saw the need uh, I saw the need in moms that uh -huh. were struggling to okay. keep it together right, right, every right. day. Uh -huh. So I knew that by me sharing my struggles, uh -huh. daily struggles with my kids, I could help other moms and dads who are having also a hard time. Well, I'm telling you, because I, I, I saw some of your Facebook posting and things. You keep it real. Yes. You keep it very real. Yes. There's like uh, potty training <laughs> and what it means to deal with that. There's issues of depression yeah. and antidepressant drugs and what, what has to do with that. There's issues of uh, the po points in your life, like your relationship with your mother, when a, a engagement was broken off and these things are triggers that lead to right. depression and how many times women will just deal with this alone. Yes. Like we talked about in the Christian faith, yes. you live, do life together, you know, and you live in community and you'll say that they, they'll hide that They'll put out the front, you know, like everything's fine, but it's not. How, how is that deadly or can it be? It's awful because they become suicidal. Uh -huh. They keep falling apart over and over and over and breaking into pieces. And it just gets to the point where they just, it's hard to get back together uh -huh. again as one. So uh -huh. it just kind of like keeps escalating and escalating. And the bigger problem with it also is that they take it out on their families. Yeah. On the kids, on yeah, the it husband. Becomes a set, it comes like a downward spiral. Right. You can't stop. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it's definitely not a good combination. It's not a good place to be in. Okay. One of your testimonies, you talked about depression and dealing with that. And then you said you went to some counselors and you had these antidepressant medications, which I guess, you know, are of some benefit. But you came to a point where you said, I'm not just going to keep taking these medications and I higher dosage or try this right. other one. Yeah. But I want to, in a sense, kind of have a cleansing. Right. I'm going to get in better shape. Yes. I'm going to, my diet's going, how did you have that sort of epiphany? Uh, because I was tired of being tired. Mm -hmm. I was tired of not 
feeling well, of not being able to keep up with my kids, of not having energy, and also because I didn't feel good about how I looked. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to be get back into you know the shape that I was before I had the kids. Okay. And once you know I discovered that there was other ways to do it with alternative medicine, yeah. which is holistic, right. what I do, um, I realized that if I made certain changes to my diet, if you know I exercised. Gluten was the big thing. Yes. Gluten. gluten actually affects your brain, and yes. if, you, if you're depressive, it makes it worse. Makes it worse. Okay. Yeah, and it's very inflammatory to the body. Okay. Also, so three years ago, you know, I got off the gluten. I limited it on my kids. Also, so now we mm -hmm. do mainly gluten-free, clean eating. You know, stay away from the processed foods. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of carbs. Very, like I said, very clean. You know, back to basics eating. Mm -hmm nothing packaged, processed. So those, you My know. My wife says in the, in the grocery store, you want to buy stuff on the outer aisles. Right, right, not like the inner. Like fruit and vegetables, right. oh, fresh meats, I'm in the meat. Kind Organic, of Organic, yeah, you know, yeah. Dairy, but, but not all the chips and crackers. Yeah, you want to stay like away from the middle section. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. stay, you know, towards, like you said, the outer ones, the right, dairy, right, right. the produce, you know, the fresh meats like, mm -hmm. and all that. Like basically go back to like just, you know, cooking from scratch. Mm -hmm. Now, so this helped, but then also it seemed like you got in touch a little bit with your, your formulative relationship with your mother. And, it's, and I don't mean to talk bad about your mother or anything like no, that, but the no. sense was I could never be good enough, I could never be smart enough, I could never, and there was some real self-image things that were put upon you at a young age through your parents and that the damage that that can, that can do. That can last for years, forever. Yeah. Where I get that sense of that, I just don't feel sometimes like I'm good enough, I'm uh -huh. pretty enough, skinny enough. Uh -huh. You know, I don't bring enough value to the table and it's because I can never please my mother. Right. I, you know, she was always critical. Nothing was ever good. So that sticks with you for the rest of your life and it makes a huge impact on how you look at yourself and how you make decisions and who you hang around with. Yeah. It's huge. And it becomes self-perpetuating. Right. This is the most frightening part. Do you ever see that? Do you ever see your mother in the way that you relate to your kids then? Sometimes. Do you try to break the cycle yes. though? Yes, but it, sometimes I've already done it. So okay. then I'm like, I gotta step back and say, I can't do that again. You know, I have to work on those issues. So yes, for me, for example, it's a money, like, issue like I you know my mother had this you know thing about that we had never had enough money mm. and that wasn't true mm -hmm. but, so she was very like limited with it so mm -hmm. that stuck with me for a long time mm -hmm. so I would say no we can't afford that we can have that and sometimes I carry that with the kids also mm -hmm. and then I'm like wait a minute but that's not the truth you know I shouldn't be imposing that mindset right. on them so I have to kind of like stop myself from right. it and you know rethink it right right and so you don't impose it so it doesn't the 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 sin if you will isn't uh, visited on the second and third generation kind of thing like you somehow break the cycle yeah and, and very you know. important is also that you know you get therapy yeah you seek out a good therapist who's going to help you work through all these issues it's not there's no shame mm -hmm. in going to see someone and talking about everything that's tormenting you, haunting you. Mm -hmm. And there, it's really, really beneficial. You work through all those heavy issues. And once mm -hmm. you work through them, then you're able to perform at a better level. Mm -hmm. And you don't repeat the same mistakes. Do you think women, especially women maybe who have gone through a divorce, they're raising children as a single parent, do you think sometimes they suffer in silence? Yes. And they try to front and everything's okay. <laughs> Look at my Facebook page. Here I am at the beach. Here I am drinking wine. Everything's fine, but inside they're dying. All the time. I see mm -hmm. it all the time. They want to put on this superwoman persona, super mom. Uh -huh. I can do it all. It's fine. I don't need help. I'm okay. I don't need support. And that's not the case. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have kids, it's hard. It's yeah. hard work. And yeah. that's what I talk about. I talk about the struggles that I face daily with them. And I'm not afraid to talk about it because that's just what it is. But a lot of women, like, no, it's the most beautiful experience in this world. Of course it is. 
But we can't forget that it also has like its lows. Oh yeah. And they can be really low. Yeah, yeah. And if you don't talk about it with someone and they can't relate with you and they can't somehow, you know, see you through those hard times, then you're gonna keep sinking. Wow. How can people get in touch with you if they want to get in touch with you? Um, NadiaGurwell.com Nadia, is my blog. NadiaGurwell.com is my blog. Okay. Yeah. And Nadia Gurwell, my Facebook. Yeah. And go to Nadia Gurwell, her Facebook. I'm telling you, there's some interesting <laughs> stuff in there. I was, I was listening to some of the videos that you put up. And like I say, you're keeping it real. It's very Definitely real. Definitely keeping it real. Uh, and, and what's going on and you can get that is there because you put a little something up on there and there was like 90 people that are like yay you're gonna be on this tv show oh it's, it's so cool it's, 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 it's impressive it's so cool anywhere i'm sorry anywhere that i can be on any platform to you know share my message yeah is amazing yeah because I just want to help moms and dads, like I said, who are struggling every day yeah. to keep it together. You know, it's interesting. There's, there's a, there's not to get too like Christian on you or anything like that, but there's this, there's this verse in Second Corinthians yeah. that says, uh, "The God of all comfort will comfort you in your afflictions, mm. so that you're able to comfort those who are in any afflictions with the comfort with which." we ourselves are comforted by God. So the idea there is that if you're going through difficult times right. and you've discovered the answer, from my perspective, it's God, you know, he allows these difficult times so that you're able to you know, reach out to others and comfort them. I right. mean, if everything's fine and you're poly popular and everything's great, you don't got much to say to someone who's like dying and, and, and so forth. So You can't relate to them. No, you don't no, know no. what it is to be in their shoes. Yeah. So what would you say to them, right? Yeah. yeah. Listen, thank you so much. Thank you so I much for having me. I appreciate it really. And, and, uh, and please come back. I and will. And you should consider writing a book. I am. You got to you just, just start pounding it out and start <laughs> writing a book. I will. Thank you for having okay, me. Okay, thanks. Take thanks care. so much. Okay, so we've, we're covering a lot of bases tonight. And actually, uh, uh, a member of the a family that was actually in that, uh, that uh, um, house is here. Tom is here. He's made the, he's made the uh, group. So if he comes around this way, that would be great. And we just want to get his perspective. I don't know if Tim, Tony, and Harold are still in the studio, but thank you. Please have a seat right here. And, uh, and I'm telling you, it was such a dramatic situation um, with uh, what, what happened. Again, Bunker Hill Church. Uh, we're not on the water very yet, but we will be in July. But Bunker Hill Church... It's, um, it's on Bunker Hill Road in, in uh, Waterbury, Connecticut. And thanks so much for coming down. It's nice to meet I know, you. I know, I know. It's kind of fun to put a face with the, wow. with the, with the word. Now, listen, I'm going to go through some people here. There's okay. Crystal. Yes. Uh, Sophia. Tom. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yourself. Sh Cheyenne. Shane. Shane. Uh, Giovanni. Mm -hmm. who, who was there, too? That was good. Um, uh Hold on, uh, Gabrielli, who was mm -hmm. missing at first, but yep. the founder. founder. Oh, that was so heartbreaking. Uh, Kathleen, Andrew, Leah. Now was Leah in the building at the time? Oh, uh, she was. She was. She was out. I think she was over at the church. Believe it or not. Oh, she was. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm. I'm church proud, but it was kind of good. You kind of good that the church was there. Uh, at least that. Morning, it was. Huh? It was amazing. It was like the right place, the right time. Everything. Yeah. I mean, for something bad like that to happen it was just they, there they were yeah. you know helping my family get to safety and everything it was it was a beautiful thing wow, wow. so um yeah and by okay here here they come uh we'll give them that we'll give them the handheld mic real quick because oh these are some these are some of the guys i just wanted that's tony the auto mechanic uh, the yeah. auto mechanic yeah. so you guys know each other already yeah. and then uh big tim at the end there he's the Thanks, handsome man. devil there you, and uh harold as well Hi, harold. uh Thanks. but just Real quick, what were your recollections from that, uh, uh, from Sunday morning and, and how it all went down? It went from a pretty sleepy morning to total bedlam. Yeah. And um, I know that uh, my family had assembled in an area of safety. Uh, it was on our roof, on a second floor roof in the back. Right. And they, uh, the, the church had just suddenly appeared. There was a... I don't know anywhere from five so now, to ten people. So now, people. were you out on the out on the roof? No, I was actually in the backyard, and I saw them up there, and they were starting to bring people down. And then suddenly, here's this uh, this group of men uh -huh. just helping my family off the roof. It was just like wow. 
So you know. when did you when did you first notice that there's smoke, there's fire, and what did you do? Well, um, I I don't remember much. I remember I was watching television with my uh, grandkids, and um, it looked like somebody was at my front door. It looked kind of dark out front oh. because it was an absolutely beautiful day. There's right. no clouds or anything. And when I went to open the, I went to the front and went to open the door, and I saw flames, and I just said, hey, "Everybody, get out, get out." Okay. And uh, were and you the one it, throwing the animals out the windows? Yeah. Okay. That was okay. me. I'm guilty. <laughs> Literally raining dogs. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but everybody, uh, it seemed like everybody was just it 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 becomes a blur at that point. Yeah. You know, you're just it's so you're, fast. You're That's what everyone says. Exactly. It's just going so fast. Yeah. Exactly. So. I, um, I was, when I was out in the back, I watched the, the members of the church come up. I, I didn't know who they were at first, but I found out later they had literally come out the back door of the church and were helping, helping my family to safety. And, uh, and then it was a matter of me, okay, time to do other things. You know, I looking at my car, I said, maybe I can move it out of the way. I moved one car out of the way. There was another one that actually got involved in the fire. Oh, really? So it was a, yeah, it was a loss there. Oh. But, um, so by the time you got out and you came around the back, you saw what was there was uh, three children, two adults, or four children, two adults. I'm not. I'm not dog. sure. I no. The dog was one is hidden under a car out in the street. Okay. I don't. I don't know where the other one went. But I saw. Um, I did see my 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 oldest daughter, uh, or excuse me, my uh, Sophia. Uh -huh. She's she's four, 14. I saw her. She was being helped off the roof. I looked at Shane, and he basically gave me a thumbs up, like everything's okay. Wow. And so I heard popping on the north side of the building, and I looked down there, and I'd like, oh, my car, and you know, yeah, I, I attempted to move it, but it was just, it was too hot. So wow. uh, I moved one car that was parked in front of the building out of the way so the fire truck could, you know, pull in, you wow. know. And then it was just total. It was. To me, it looked chaotic, but things went as far as the fire department showing up. They were there within a matter of minutes. The police department, there in a matter of minutes. Yeah. The EMS people, there in a matter of minutes. I mean, neighbors helping me, church people helping me. I, it's like, I, I don't know what to say. I, you know, people, sometimes Waterbury can get like kind of a, not the greatest reputation, yeah. but when I saw people coming together to help us. It just completely changed my attitude about where I lived and the people that were there. It was it was, it was a very moving time for me at that point. Wow! So, wow! You know. Well, anyway, so like I say, this is uh, Tim, Tony, and Harold. I yeah. Had you met them before, or did you just meet them here? I met him. He That's helped up. me. He was helping me uh, change spark plugs. Oh, okay, yeah. okay, okay. Uh, so so it was it going. was a beautiful thing. I've yeah. seen both of these gentlemen here. Yeah. Um, going coming and going to the church uh -huh. so yeah know. so when you came around and you saw them getting the your family out these were these were some of the guys in wow. the in the bucket line of humanity oh my <laughs> yeah it was it was exactly. it was a beautiful thing yeah. so anyway so do you have anything to share with uh, the your neighbor well, I just it, it was it was just an honor to, to help your family out it really was I mean it is under the circumstances, obviously, it would have been nicer to have a, you know, more of a formal, but uh, it, was, it was a beautiful thing. It really well, was a beautiful thing. you got a beautiful family. Thank you yes. very much. I just, I, I want to, on behalf of, the, of the, my family, to thank you guys for, you know, stepping into some pretty dangerous stuff and helping my family. So thank you so much. Appreciate it. Absolutely. All right. Yeah, we were talking a little bit that, uh, I think it was uh, Luke that said, you know, it happened right during the church service. You yeah. had these borderline heroic, able-bodied young men ready to spring into action. Like so I, said, I right mean, the, place, the, right the time. fact yeah. that it ended with no loss of life—it's mm. a tragedy that the house is a total wreck. But I don't know. I mean, to me, it, it's as—it's as good an outcome as you could as you could expect. Well, yeah. I'm just glad the the family is alive. Um, they're still kind of shook up about what happened, but. Yeah. You know, over time, I'm sure, I'm hoping and pretty sure that they'll get their, get back onto a more stable footing as far as, 
you know, being able to deal with stuff. So. Yeah. Is there, and I talked to Crystal, that's your daughter? Yeah. Crystal. So I was talking to her because she was like getting coordinated, you know, everyone's in different houses and stuff. Yeah. And uh, she was at some home that I guess has taken them in or what have you, and there's a pool. And there's just like yeah. screaming kids in the background. Yeah. And I said, I hope that I hope that's Gabby, you know, screaming in the background. And yeah. she was fine, just joyful screaming. Good. And uh, but it was like, uh, yeah, that's that's Gabby, because there was a moment there where no one knew where Gabby was, mm -hmm. uh, and that was that was pretty scary. Uh, Tim, I'll give you the last word on all this. Um, uh, everyone has said, I'm just we're just grateful, you know, we were there, and uh, you know. As Christians, we're all about saving people. Sometimes it's spiritually, and sometimes it's physically, and <laughs> I'm glad we were able to do it this time. Yeah. Yeah. Again, thank you so much. I appreciate all what you guys did. Well, listen, thanks for coming in. It's good seeing so you. The, the, I know it's suds and duds. You go left. Yeah. Every, everyone gets lost coming down here, but okay. I appreciate you making the trip. Well, thanks. All right. Good. Thanks. Thanks so much. Okay, next up in this fast-moving show, uh, you know, there's a lot going on. Usually in this show we talk about current events, we talk about uh, authors, politicians, and things like that. And the one touchstone we always have is Dave Strait, because Dave Strait, uh, frankly, he works cheap. Uh, he never charges us for these commentaries, and uh, that's, a, that's a beautiful thing, but he comes in uh, just to talk about current events and what's going on, and uh, and he's joining us right now, and he has some thoughts. Marty, thank you so much. I'm just in time to read the credits. Not at all. Not at all. You've got you've got you've got a ton of time, but that's quite so. I mean, I, I, Fascinating story. It's a beautiful thing. I'm people telling. People helping people. Oh my gosh. And well, I was in the church at that time. I didn't do anything heroic except I picked up dog poop. Because one of the dogs... That can be a big deal. That can be a big deal. But, um, Scoop and poop. No, I'm, I'm telling you, these, these guys um, were just incredible. Uh, yeah. Just, just, just incredible what they, what they did. Uh, running towards the burning building when everyone else was, you know, yeah. getting people away. So yeah. it was, I, I could not be more proud of Walnut Hill Community Church. But anyways. Quote of the week. Quote of the week. Yeah, give us, give us some current events. Let's get back to... No collusion. No cover up. He's a leaker. <laughs> that was the best quote. Donald Trump, right? Donald Trump. He's a leaker. Oh, no in an instant, he got rid of the whole Russian nonsense, right? No collusion. No, no cover up. No cover up. He's a leaker. He's a leaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, oh, you know, this is for Rich. Hope Rich is out there listening because okay. there was a, uh, you know, another study heading towards the North Pole. It was called the Ship of Fools, appropriately named. Ship of Fools 3. Yeah, okay. To study global warming. Hey, got stuck in the ice, had to turn around, call an icebreaker, and get out of there. Is that right? Yeah, there's too much ice, you know? Where's that global warming coming from? I don't know. That's pretty, that's pretty ironic. So, you know, you and I talked on the phone about this whole thing about, oh, we can't have foreign powers influencing an election. Yes. Right? Well, yeah. Well, that's the big thing. Wait, Only no, no, we right. can influence them. Yeah, unless they can influence unless us. Unless it's Barack Obama and he's influencing the Israeli oh, election against Benjamin Netanyahu. Or let's say the Ukraine. Or the Ukrainian election, yeah, or, or Brexit. Brexit. I, I, yeah, Brexit, he said, yeah. if you vote for this, you're going to get to the yeah. back of the bus. So A lot of back of the bus analogies with... Uh, with uh, totally inappropriate. Yeah, I agree. It's, yeah, so I, I don't know. I, I just think that, I guess, he, I guess Americans are jealous that other people are starting to do what we've been doing all the time. Well, well so... No, okay, aside. The Obama administration sent over four key... Um, lobbyists. Elect, uh, lo well, not lo lobbyists. They, they strategists. They were like campaign strategists and operatives into Israel. Yeah. They put millions and millions of dollars right. into Benjamin Netanyahu's opponent in their national election. Hmm. And you, you, it's cricket sounds, cricket sounds, well, you know, if that's a problem. Well, but uh, the point of it is <coughs> hacking elections, all that nonsense. Everyone is trying to affect everyone else's elections. And, you know, they're, they're making a mountain out of a mountain. So why doesn't anybody complain about the influence that Mexico is having in the U.S. <laughs> political system and how they worked desperately to get Hillary Clinton elected? Now, yeah. nobody's talking about that, right? No. <laughs> so the connection is right? the New York Times. Why are they consistently publishing articles that come from anonymous <laughs> sources Excuse that me. are un unsubstantiated? Excuse me. Get me all choked up. I'm a, I'm a bundle of nerves. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so all these stories are unsubstantiated, anonymous sources... They print them, they're always proven wrong, and they never issue a retraction. But the damage is done with the leak. Okay, this He's is, a leaker. This is exactly what I'm going to do. 
When are you going to stop beating your wife? What, what, what are you talking about? We need an investigation into you beating your wife. Why, why, why do we have an investigation? You're trying to thwart our investigation. You need to be, yeah. you need to be, I mean, that's what we got going on. We, we got this collusion nonsense, and then they're saying, well, he's obstructing justice in our pursuit of a non-issue, which is this collusion that never happened. Oh, but don't you see who's on first and what's on second? And we need a special prosecutor. The American people are waking up to all this nonsense, and they see it for what it is. And Donald Trump, God bless him, I don't know if he's doing it during his morning bathroom time or whatever, but he gets on that tweeter thing, and he starts tweeting out, this is nonsense. You know, basically it's an investigation after a, a, a false story about collusion because Hillary lost the election, and he just ends it with, nice. I love the guy. Yeah. So, uh, Mexico. Oh, yes, Mexico. I'm Interf sorry. Yeah. Interfering in the U.S. election process. This is a, this is a subtle uh, you know, connection you've made, but please. Subtle? It's, it's blatantly <laughs> obvious, and I can't believe none of the conservative talk shows or hosts are making the connection. The New York Times is owned by Carlos Slim, the wealthiest person, A, maybe in the world, but uh -huh. certainly in Mexico. And he owns, you know, 16, the largest shareholder in the New York Times. Is it any wonder that nobody picks on him? Hmm. Guess not. And is there any wonder why all the articles in the New York Times are anti-Trump? It's because Carlos Slim is ganging up on him. Well, but that's legal, right? Okay. I grant you the point. I get the international well, point. Yeah. I, I, I grant you the fact. Yeah. That's fine. I will just say that the New York Times has been uh, very, very liberal for years, even before the Mexicans uh, or this very rich Mexican came in and bought it. The Schlossbergers or something like that, I believe yeah. is who it was. Yeah, yeah. But anyways, yeah. what else we got? What about well, these Republicans getting shot? Are we well, concerned about this? Well, I mean, if we're going to go to a shooting war, I'm putting my money on the NRA conservative Republican guys. You know, it's, it's just an absolute tragedy no matter how you cut it. You know, I, uh, can you blame an ideology? No, nah, I don't think you can. It's just bad things happen, and that's just the way it is. They're, you're never going to run out of nuts in this world. Um, on, a brighter, on a brighter side... I think you saw that the first coal mine opened in Pennsylvania. I have no Rather idea. exciting. Yeah, and the GDP, coal production and mine production and gas and, and, and natural gas production are all up. So do you think the people in West Virginia, remember when Hillary went down there and says, look guys, we're going to put you all out of business, but we're going to get you good jobs. Yeah, How do you think they're no, feeling we're now? Pretty darn good, huh? Oh yeah, they want to, coal like, miners want a coal mine. They've been doing it for generations. Right, you know, I get more excited, I get as excited about coal production in this country and energy from coal as I do anything. Everybody thinks that this all this nat nat gas is such a great thing. It's not a bad thing any more than coal's a bad thing. Yeah. And no. clean coal's a great thing as a matter There's of fact. There's some, and you got to Google this, but it's something like the island of Cuba where you have uh, Guantanamo. And, and anyways, one, one part of the island they have to use like wood for their fuel. You know, and the other part has coal, you yeah. know, good, clean yeah. burning coal. Yeah. And it's much better for the, uh, for the ecosystem. It's much better for the environment and everything else. The other side that has to just burn sticks and wood and stuff like that, it's not good. No, not good at all. Uh, here, I was kind of, you'll be happy to know that um, half of the high schools in America are doing away with class rankings so as not to destroy teen confidence. <laughs> now, that, this is what's hilarious. They did a poll. Yeah. This was a global poll. This was uh, last year. They did this poll and they polled students and they said, how do you think you perform on a Nash global level? Yeah. 76% of Americans thought we did great. Right. Right? We're actually number 46. In what now? We're talking like mathematics math, or something uh, like that? Mathematics, science, and English. Okay, okay, okay. So the Chinese who rank like number one right. thought they were like in the bottom 10%. Okay. The moral of the story is America's really great at thinking we're really great. But that's about it, you know? I just think that's so funny. But so we don't want to ruin that confidence or shatter that delusion. So we're just gonna remove class There's this rankings. Great scene in a documentary called In Search of Superman. If you want to know about educational policy, get that documentary in case in uh, the case for Superman or in search of Superman. And it talks about that same thing yeah. and the overconfidence we have, and they show this kid on a bicycle going off a ramp and not quite making it. And he says, we lead the world in self-confidence. Uh, Mathemat mathematics, so, not so much. Uh, uh, you know, it's funny. Dick, uh, 
uh, Mark Levin always re refers to Dick Blumenthal as Little Dick Blumenthal or Little Dick Durbin. It's kind of funny, but so anyway, so he had. I think that's childish, but go ahead. Well, it's okay. So I'm, I'm Dick, Dick Blumenthal. I wish he'd get like a real job. I, I usually call his office once a month and I say, "Hey, uh, when Dick gets back from Vietnam, could you?" Oh, I'm sorry. That's right. He's never been to Vietnam. And he also said he was a captain of the Harvard swim team. Yeah, which well, is not true either. Typical delusion, but he gets a pass because he's on the left is the right. Yeah. So anyway, um, he and 190. 99 other Democrats are trying to sue Trump. Like, don't, with the world going down in flames, with buildings burning, you know, we don't have politicians running in to save the burning, the people in the fire. Yeah. They're out there for the photo op saying, look at me. Excellent tie in with the previous part of this show. I appreciate that. Yes, it was yeah. just coincidental, I'm no, sure. It's good. Uh, okay, and in an ominous sign, states' revenue right now, two thirds of the states right now, are getting less revenue in than they're pro they projected. Two thirds of the state across the country, across or are you talking about country. Connecticut? Two thirds of the states. Well, I know country. Connecticut's in the vanguard of that getting they're less done. money. Illinois now is one notch above junk, and their spreads versus. Um, We're talking about like their state issue bonds. Yeah, yeah. We're talking bonds. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Bonds. General okay. obligation, everything. In fact, the the lotto the lottery pulled out of Illinois now because they can't function there with the 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 system they have. I do know that the. New, uh, the sh Illinois state troopers cannot get gas in their vehicles using a state credit card because it's not paying off. Well, something and, like that. Right. And this week, I mean, that's a little a bunch ridiculous. of the construction, the construction companies on the interstates were were issued cease and desist orders effective next week because they don't have the money. There's to no pay. money to finish the roads. Yeah. So what? So, so you have a contract to to pay 153 you know, miles of yes. road, yeah. you're on mile number 76, and they're like, yeah, let's just stop it right there because we got no more money. Well, and they're sitting there baffled. The politicians are baffled. They're sitting there saying, but we fashioned this under Hugo Chavez. <laughs> like, you know, how can it not work? Oh, that's Venezuela. That's right. Where everybody lost 16 pounds last year because there was no food to eat. I heard it was 19. 19? Yeah, Why? 19. Yeah, yeah. yeah so Venez anarchy. I've been though. to Venezuela countless number of times you have yeah and i really? can yeah i can tell you in venezuela yeah uh, you know so business <laughs> yeah. so the the people are the most peaceful type people ever for them to be rising up is unbelievable yeah. it's sheer despair you know it's a, for people they have nothing to lose then they lose everything i mean these they, people are dying they don't have toilet paper just imagine that no toilet paper people are hijacking food Hijacking trucks that have food, and they're Horrible. just they're just they're just ravishing trucks just to get food to feed their children. Um, okay, That's so the utopia that communism. We're on the home stretch, and this, this is you know there's a story uh, about this guy, and his name was Bart Sachs, and Bart Sachs was being prosecuted by the U.S. government because he tried to take forty thousand dollars worth of um, medicine into Iraq to try and save children. So the U.S. didn't want to come out and prosecute them for taking medicine in to save children. So they, they trumped up charges against him for spending money in Iraq. Mm. So this guy's life is ruined, his career is ruined, and all he's doing is trying to save kids. The U.S. admitted, and this was four years ago, admitted to killing 500,000 kids in Iraq. And the, one of the ways they did it is diabolical. They destroy the water system and the power system, and then you get typhoid and all the diseases that sweep through and kill kids. 500,000 kids, U.S. hands, guilt. I'm telling you, this government is so guilty of genocide in the Middle East, it makes me sick. Anyway, hold, we're hold, almost out hold, of time. We're almost out of time. I want to thank especially our guests from uh, Walnut Hill Community Church for coming in, and I salute you and your heroic efforts in saving those people next door. And to the people next door and the people in the community, we love you. And we're so happy that we were there, and we're so happy that those men had a chance to uh, act heroically and save all those lives. So just applause all the way around. Thank you, thank God. And I do believe that God may have had a hand in all that. I want to thank my guests too, uh, Narnia, and please look her up on the web. Uh, Nadia Gerwell, G-E-R-W-E-L-L. -E -L. A lot of good stuff. And next week, potentially, <coughs> we're going to have Dan Carter coming in. We know we're going to have Al Alper coming in. And Dan Carter, few, uh, former uh, candidate for Senate, might come in and say, I want to be your next governor. And wouldn't that be great? Right here on the Marty Heiser Show, good night. 
Walnut Hill Community Church, we salute you and the neighbors in that community. God bless. We'll see you next week.